uh, I think this is a different video thing. Oh, this is for the big poetry reading tonight. Big one? Yeah, really oh, huge. Oh, like the biggest oh. one in 20 years. Are you going to come? All of the readers uh, this evening are published by Hanuman Books. Hanuman Books is a small press that was founded in 1985 by Francesco Clemente and Raymond Foy, that's me, in Madras, India, in order to publish writers who we liked, who we thought were overlooked and neglected. And this evening is a gathering of essentially all of those writers, uh, at least all the ones who are living. Are you hip? One or two. You're right. I live there. I'm so nervous. I've never written, I've never read with so many good poets before. And in this distinguished evening, I, I figure I gotta come through. But you know, if I, if I throw up, don't take it personally. <laughs> Once when I was a young child, I had been invited by friends of my parents to spend several weeks in the country living in a summer cabin, as it was called, where there was a large flower garden and an even larger vegetable garden and great huge trees and hills and a beautiful winding river where I swam and went canoeing. The people I lived with owned a big brown and white collie dog named Tamer, and he was my constant companion. It was my first encounter with a dog as a friend, and I talked to Tamer as though he could understand everything I said. Revealing secrets to him I had never shared with anyone. The cabin, or house, was built at the top of a hill and from this screened and closed front porch, one could see clear over to the opposite side of the river. Immediately in front of the house, the hill began descending and it was rather a long distance down to the river banks. And in the evening, the view of the setting sun was beautiful. The one very unusual happening of that summer for me had to do with the sunset. And all these years I've remembered every so often that particular sunset. I was a fairly intelligent child and usually could be depended upon to obey instructions and behave in a self-reliant manner. Therefore, when one afternoon I was left alone, there was very little worry on the part of the people who had left me. And I failed to recall why they had to leave me behind when they drove away, but they had praised me and explained there was no need for me to have someone with me on this occasion, since Tamer was to be left behind also, and surely I was big enough to help myself to food which had been prepared and set aside for me, and to going to bed would be no problem. And they assured me they would return before the next morning. And of course, I was too sensible a boy to be afraid of anything like the dark. I think I was five years old, or at the time, perhaps six. And extremely precocious. And so suddenly, I was all alone and master of the house. 
And I spoke to Tamer and kept him as nearby as possible. And he and I moved through the several rooms of the cabin, and although it wasn't dinner time, I decided to have something to eat. And there were only two neighbors, and they had their places a good distance from our place. And although I could look through the kitchen window and see another house through some trees, seemed rather far away. On the evening of this story, as I walked from the interior of the house out onto the porch, I became aware of the sky, which had turned a wild, furious crimson from the huge, glowing red disk of the sun radiating shafts of gold light and or at rushing speed plunged below the horizon. I stood nearly riveted to the spot, bathed in pinkish tint and surrounded by an almost red world, everything reflecting the sunset and filled with awe and an inward fright. And I felt the tenseness of my being alone, and although I've suffered acute awareness of loneliness many times throughout my life, I've never sensed it quite as thoroughly or traumatically as on that evening when all the world turned into burning flame. And it was as though I was already in the process of being consumed. And I was not brave at all any longer. And was out and out, afraid, clinging, scared, as I've ever been in my life. Very slowly and carefully, I looked all around me, speaking in whispers to Tamer, and finally along with Tamer, withdrawing into the room which had been mine since my coming there to visit. And I climbed into my bed and tried to coax Tamer up beside me, and he simply refused stalked in somewhat haughty manner out of the room, disappearing from my view, and eventually, I suppose, settling down for the night in his own spot. There isn't much more except to say the sun setting on that warm summer evening was one of the most frightening experiences of my life. But today, the sunset can fill me with an awareness of beauty that nothing else can. <laughs> Thank you. Things to do in Valley of the Dolls, the movie. <laughs> Move to New York, lose your virginity, become a star, send money to your mother, call Pills Dolls, fire the talented newcomer, have a nervous breakdown, suffer from an incurable degenerative disease, sing the theme song, do your first nude scene, wear gowns designed by Trevia, become addicted to booze and dope, scream, who needs you? <laughs> Stagger around in a half slip and bra, come to in a sleazy hotel room, say, I am merely traveling incognito, 
get drummed out of Hollywood, come crawling back to Broadway, pull off Susan Hayward's wig and try to flush it down the toilet, <laughs> end up in a sanitarium, <clears throat> hiss it wasn't a nut house, get an abortion, go on a binge, detect a lump in your breast, commit suicide, make a comeback, <laughs> overact. <clears throat> God and the devil, Jesus, and the temptation of St. Anthony by demons attributed to Sestetta. God was overprotective, punishing my transgressors in excess of my injury. In retaliation, I affected a style inimical to him. God is capricious, pedomaniacal, tyrannical, absent-minded, inattentive, captious, fickle, violent, lazy, indifferent, smug, untrustworthy, a practical joker, perfidious, and as I got older, just didn't care about me anymore. Only interested in surface things, intentions matter not at all. God does not read your heart. The heart is a dark well. God is a force, has no sound, no smell, so cannot be touched. The devil is a person. When Jesus knocks at the heart's portal, he stinks. Hair matted with blood is scabby, clothes not the latest, is perhaps in advanced decomposition with thorns sticking out of the eye sockets, the corners of the eyes maggoty. For example, when my house burned down, not one person found me a bed. Mm. In Sassetta's painting of Anthony Abbott and the devil, the devil is a lovely young woman, fashionably coiffed, arms folded across her chest as if tapping her foot, archly demanding a response. Her skirt, you will carefully note, is slit up the side. The only hint that she may not be a wholesome presence is the pair of tourmaline-colored wings of bat design at her shoulders. In real life, we don't get such a hint. When you hold your cigarette lighter to his asshole, it isn't until he hears the hairs and smells them burning that Tony flinches. Hard it is for the heart to go out to this heap of smashed men pile on along the subway walk for the homeless men. Hard it is for the heart to go out to this heap of smashed men pile on along the subway walk. What can save these men? Their faces are too far gone. No need, they need more than a bath, a meal, a bed. These old, broken, ugly faces cannot even elicit pity. They've no tragedy about them. They're finished. They're dead men. Man has heart, not life. Life is heartless. Yeah, no wonder. It sees man come and go endlessly. For whom in particular should it care? Thank the system of things is death. But death is merciful, though unwelcome. I saw one grab a piece of, yeah. I saw one grab a piece from two rats. Like pigs, they shit where they sleep. A broken bottle of Thunderbird. It's a desperate danger of fear filled with despair. So this one I had not worked on. But these are the feelings I had uh, coming back after two years in Rome and walking these streets uh, and these subways. Oh, boy. But their faces, they, lo they lost just by the look. Somebody was wiped out. Dodge's secret was his thirst. He was a golden showers guy, a guy into water sports, a pea hag. During the day, he was like everyone else. He drank coffee for breakfast, and at dinner time, he drank mineral water or wine at the table. But late at night, in damp pee bars, he drank urine. <laughs> Everything was fine until one spring night when he heard about this disease called grid and how it waved through the air at gay discos. At first, only handfuls of people were concerned about it. But after that, all kinds of people started coming down with it, and the name was changed from grid to AIDS. And it was discovered that it was a virus contracted through body fluids. So naturally, Dodge got really scared. He got a test, and the results were positive for the virus. A few months later, he got really sick, so he went to the hospital to die. What else was there to do? Everything meant nothing now. He saw all the important things of his life become like the leaves on a tree after the summer is over. He made ready to die as soon as possible, and no one blamed him. Despairing and brokenhearted, he decided to get prepared so that he could meet death with everything in order. 
along with drawing up his will, planning a big furniture and clothes giveaway. He wanted also to do some spiritual studying so he could greet God having done his homework. As if the Bible, the Torah, the Koran, the Tibetan and Egyptian books of the dead were required reading, he poured over these pages of ancient texts and memorized the high points. The last book on his list was the Bhagavad Gita. He read it, but he didn't get it. Too many gods and goddesses. He was told by someone that he ought to read the biography of Gandhi instead because Gandhi was a Jainist and embodied the spirit of the Hindu scriptures. It was while reading this biography that everything changed for Dodge. This book became his real salvation. Actually, it wasn't the book itself, but a fact about Gandhi that it revealed. To his wild delight, Dodge discovered that Gandhi, to maintain optimum health, drank his own urine every day. And that's true, by the way. He discovered that many people, prime ministers and leaders in India, did likewise. Then he found out that lots of healthy people all over the world, including people in the United States, were drinking their own urine. It was a homeopathic remedy. It worked the same way vaccines work. Well, Dodge couldn't believe it. It was, it was a miracle. It was exciting, mind-boggling, a new adventure. It made perfect sense. He was a new man immediately. The minute he read the passage on Gandhi's urine drinking, he grabbed his urinal bottle and downed it with gusto. He was back on his feet in three days. As long as he drank his own urine, he knew he was going to get well. He threw away his prescription pills. He ripped up his doctor's phone numbers. He tossed away the aluminum walker. He was happy with his own urine. It tasted really great. And what a cheap cure. Free, in fact. And he'd certainly never misplaced his medicine. It was all right there in his handy bladder. <laughs> a year later, after the discovery of Gandhi's secret, Dodge was healthy and happy. He even discovered a medical facility, an institute in New York City, that was exclusively for life fluids drinkers. They had meetings, and he decided to attend. Actually, this thing does exist. It took a lot of courage to walk into that meeting room the first time. He'd been terrified until he finally lifted his downcast eyes and looked around. Lo, and behold, all his old buddies from the pea bars were there, smiling at him, happy to see him, clapping for him. He felt like he had somehow suddenly returned home. His cup ran over. He was once again where he belonged, among the 1%. Thanks. I remember you. You raped me one night. When I was coming home alone, you sneaked up near me and whispered in my ear and put, I, gotta have my, I forgot to put on my glasses. Maybe my sight's coming back. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> listen, I bet the radio works good. Though. The, radio, the radio is, let's go back to basic old fashioned radio because they, they, it doesn't even need batteries most of the time. <laughs> Sneaked up near me and whispered in my ear, put your arms. <laughs> yeah, WNCN, it always comes through. They're like in between WNYC, WQXR. I remember you. You raped me one night. When I was coming home alone, you sneaked up near me and whispered in my ear and put your arms around me and squeezed and threw me on the grass, stripping my clothes and tearing deliciously on the wet grass and inundating my loins at midnight near Brooklyn in a deserted section of desperation. 
and I rolled over to receive all of you that night. I remember you, you were strong, oh, so strong, so, 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 such a rapist. <laughs> a whispering rapist, round about midnight, and you took me. Where are you? <laughs> Your disjointed clothes, your strong face breathing heavily against mine, your silent rape <coughs> will remind me indefinitely. To Ted. Oh, Ted brilliant light in the saucepan of our night, forever smoking, rudely polite, truly great, whoever next to you sat or stood, that would know, would that they would, and greatly warm, you invented, not wrote, your works, as you would say, laments, for instance, or Memorial Day. Though beautifully you did write, as in my favorite work, Cranston near the city line, the last time clearly I remember conversing with you sitting outside the center bar, I told you it was great and you agreed. Dear Ted, wrongly right in the fever of our night, hello, it is 2.10 a.m. Do you look as I remember? Chicago, three years ago or four, you gave a magical reading in ivy-covered Ida Noise and wrote, as a dedication to someone you'd only just met, to Morgan, who taught me everything I know. Hysterical. The genius kid holding court on St. Mark's place. Somehow not his place in the bright, real world. Oh, Ted, think not unkindly of these words. We all love you. Do you look on us from over the Navy Yard and smile and light a lucky strike? and wait for us to join you in the night. The world is fast, its strength hard to master, yet know how we love you, faster, faster. It's a new year, you try and stick your keys in the door. A neighbor's feet are coming down, your fingers slip, his wrist goes for the knob, because he's in. That's the problem with doors, the people inside have no patience with my fumbling. What kind of year is this? Life is a vow that frightens as it deepens. You know which ones. I've never written a poem to you before, wearing my organs outside, or am I in? lifting myself like a chalice to time, a can of Coke spinning on the floor. You're right, I'm different. That might be all we invented this year. In light of the recent interpretations, translations, migrations, in spite of all that, it's great that we did one single thing, to be different. And now that it shows, we should go really slow, wearing our difference like streamers and leaves, bringing our gifts to the city, to watch the monster slowly unwrap us, naked and forlorn, and I'm not like anyone else. Feeling my foot, I hear music bridging the city. It's not the poor, it's not the rich, it's us. And improved public transportation and cable TV. I'm giving up my idea of writing a great poem. I hate this shitty little place. And a dog takes a bite of the night. We realized the city was sold in 1978, but we were asleep. We woke and the victors were all around us criticizing our pull chain lights. And we began to pray, oh God, take care of the city and take care of me. Cigarettes and coffee were always enough in my youth. Now when I wake up thousands of times in the day, I was in the process of buying my love a shepherd's flute and a thin hand picked the one I wanted off the top of the pile, the one I heard which played so sweet. And I bought a dud, hardly better than a soda bottle. Well, the backpack you gave me has started to rip. And the scarf, well, I love the scarf, but I keep reliving that canal gene remark. 
because there's no place for the ironic and plain living. It goes so fast, so you must be direct. Symbolically, I want my black jersey back. Realistically, you must give it to me because I will keep talking to your machine if you don't. Our mayor is a murderer. Our president is a killer. Jean Harris is still not free, which leads me to question the ethics of our governor, who I thought was good. There was an argument for poetry being deep, but I am not that argument. There was an argument which chiefly has to do with judging something which has nothing to do with money as worthless because you don't make any money from it. Did you call your mother a fool when she brought you your oatmeal in the morning? I cannot explain my life from the point of view of all the nicks and crannies I occupied in my childhood, yet there I sat smoking. More than anything, I want privacy. If I keep doing this, you will leave me alone. And what about poor children dying in the streets of Calcutta today or little swollen bellies in Africa? A public death, of course, has no song. At some point, I decided I would want to die in my home, and so I would have to have it, as others would have to have none. Sometime after they sold New York, I began seeing you. I was dreaming, but I felt your judgment, and I saw your face, and a woman stepped out of my house, and she opened the door. The government constitutes recreation as closely as it can from the great mind of the divine creator, a face that stands out from the crowd. If you ask a person if he was down to New York, he'll say, yeah, we would run out like dogs on the sidewalks by Lolly Lenya. Who is she? The back guard to a Knob Hill black guard in Terrazzo. A railroad garden is an interesting thing. A Baltimore kitchen garden, even more so in caution, beware. As a brazier god, I take this time out to admire them all. Sir Walter Raleigh is an interesting amalgamum to any poet's career. I don't easily enjoy others reading. Uptown, in a small Persian inlay drawing room, choose to first Alec Guinness, Tom Prido, Anti Matin Leo. Thank you. Tied up, face down, spread eagled on the bed, blindfolded and whipped, butt vibrator up my ass. Turned over, spread eagled, fucked, and whipped some more. We fuck after a terrible day of nothingness, me on top, her hands around my neck, choking me into a shaking, quivering cum. We fuck with her on top of me spontaneously in the afternoon. Her face looks so intense and scary when we fuck, sometimes that I think she's going to rip me apart. March. A day of punishment for my distant and shitty attitude on Monday. The pain was not as bad as promised, and I am relieved, but at the same time, disappointed. First fuck after a long, distant, and horrible week. It feels good to have my dick inside her. I come, pleading to be her slave again, and she says, yes, oh yes. Supposed to run errands, but we fuck instead. Me with handcuffs behind my back. She even sucks my cock. I sit in the chair, and she rides me while I pound into her until my legs are weak, and we come. May. Discuss the possibilities of her being my slave for a week. I get hard and she gets wet and we fuck before she leaves for her son's baseball game. Back in bed, I ask for and receive permission to lick her asshole, then her clit. She gets hot, I get hot, and we fuck again. While talking to my mother on the phone, I play with myself and get a hard on. Fucking after nearly a week of not being allowed to because I masturbated once. This next poem is called A Brief History of R&B. The phonograph needled the hailstorm. The country never left his voice. It stayed up on the roof where a skillet had dented his head. Crossing and uncrossing her legs. In pulp novels, the characters. Revving up their engines. When you're old enough to unlock that door, it can be any season or all of them at once. 
painted on the still wet seams of her stockings, the skyline spattered with ink spots, as shy as a violet, but a violent one, that was Sam Cooke in the kitchen. What a wonderful world to do homework in. On the other side of the blackboard, where the equation leaves off, he lost his shirt. It kept the house from falling down. It brought down the house. Then it was time to turn the record over. Um, before sex. This writhing and thrusting is designed to distract us from brooding about death. But who can forget that all we but prizes but lent to us anyway? The length of our days, our contracting attention spans, the world spun around us and the universe pulsing within. The penis, the liver, errant patches of hair, the spirit housed in its aching meat. Let all flesh bless the stumbling numbered breasts, the urges, the bloody smells, long afternoons in foreign hotels, a premonition of children. Let those who sleep in the dust guffaw at our antics or just lie silent as our half-lives elapse. We bed down and rise up as often as we can. Fireflies encircled her head as she stood on the porch at twilight. Only this act is real, only her, only me. I've always found it, found it, found it effect, effective to uh, close with an Asphuff poem. This is a new one. I'd never met her, but she wanted me to fuck her in the ass. She knew I'd value it properly. She was offering me the best of herself. When I think of her, I think of her face, and it is the base of her asshole. I would pull apart the slabs of her butt and look inside and put my tongue in. Her anus was pink at the top, and she was so welcoming and built in such a way that you could see three inches into the shadows. It was like a long, thin cone, hairless and slippery clean. She was the material whose emptiness beautifully made her asshole possible. It was as if it led all the way out her mouth, where her tongue was pushed out, her beautiful face, its edges. She was inside out. I got it slick with my saliva. It tasted sweet. It was alive. It tasted like sex, like arousal. I put my hard dick against its entrance. I fuck you in the ass. Thank you. May days. As I cross my kitchen floor, the thought of death returns day after day. As I wake and drink lemon juice and hot water, brush my teeth and blow my nose, stand at toilet, a yellow stream issuing from my body, look out curtained windows across the street, Mary help of Christians RC Church. How many years empty the garbage pail? Carry black plastic bags to the sidewalk before I boil the last soft egg. Day after day glance, my altar sitting pillow, a side long look and sigh. Past bookcases, Greek lyrics, and volumes of military industrial secrecy. How many mornings out the window, springtime's gray clouds drift over a wooden owl on the rectory roof. Pigeons flutter off the street lamp to an iron fence. I return to kitchen oatmeal cooking in an iron pot, sit on a wooden chair, choose a soup spoon, dreaming out my window, eat my gruel as Ilanthus trees bud and grow thick green like seaweed in rainy Atlantis, lose leaves after snowfall, sit bare branched in January's rusty winds, snap photographs focused on the clothesline, courtyard chimney pots a block away. How many years lie alone in bed and stroke my cock or read the times on a pillow midnight, answer telephone, talk, my stepmother or Joe in Washington wait for a knock on the door as portly Peter, sober, hesitant, inquiring supper, rarely visiting, rueful, a life gone by. You got the monthly rent? Armfuls of mid-morn mail arriving with despairing secretaries. Rise and tuck my shirt in, turn the door lock key, go down hallway stairs, enter New York City, Christine's restaurant around East 12th Street corner on First Avenue. 
taxi uptown to Frick Museum or Victor visit Dr. Brown, chest x-rays, smoking cough or flu, turn on the news from Palestine, listen to Lead Belly's Lament on Tape, Black Girl, Jim Crow Blues, Irene, and Sunday Puerto Ricans climb concrete steps week after week to church, socks in the laundry, snap on the kitchen light, midnight, icebox raid, sun-dried tomatoes, soft Swiss cheese and ham, pineapple juice, low rent control, 260 a month, clear gym seal sanded floors, white walls, Blake's tiger on the bedroom bookcase, cabs rattling on dark asphalt below, silence, a solitary house, Charles Fourier borrowed from Harry Smith on bedside table waiting inspection, reading glasses ready with neck string to hang on my breast if I rise, switch light off, pajamas in drawer for sleep, 80 volumes behind the headboard for browsing, Yiddish poetry, Attila Joseph, Sashibusan Dasgupta's obscure religious cults of Bengal, Celine, De Vulgaria Eloquentia, what riches for old age, what cozy naps and long night's dreams, browsing in Persepolis and Lahasa, what more, asked existence, except time, more time, right time and calm, and warless time to contemplate collapsing years, though body, teeth and brain and elbow ache, a crooked creak at backbone bottom, dry nostrils, mottled ankle and smart tongue, how many years to talk, snap photos, sing in theaters or improvise in classroom, street, church or radio, far from Congress, how many more years, eyes closed, 9 a.m., wake, worrying, that ulcer in my cheek, is it cancer? Should I have charged Burroughs' biographer for photos reprinted from 40 years ago? Miles, the editor's stylistic competence for literary history of the beat generation. Should I rise and meditate or sleep at daylight, recuperate flu? Phone ringing half an hour ago. What's on the answering machine? Give back all those advances to Harper's? Who promised deadlines for this photo book? Wasn't I up at 2 a.m. revising poems? Spontaneous verse? Take a plane to Greenland? Visit Dublin? Pen Club meets May 17. Decision Israeli censorship of Arabic press. Call Cynthia Ozick, Yiddish translator, poetess, Zionist, Yanta. Write concentration camp expert, moralist, Eli Wiesel, Eli Wiesel. What's his word? Quote, Arabs should throw words, not stones. Unquote. Is that quote accurate from the Times? Should I get up right now? Cross-legged scribbling journals with motor roar downstairs in the street. Stolen autos doctored at the curb. Or pull the covers over achy bones. How many years awake or sleepy? How many mornings to be or not to be? How many morning maze to come? Birds chirp insistent on six-story roofs. Buds rise in backyard cities. Forsythia yellow by brick walls and rusty bread springs near the fence. How many Sundays lie awake and lie immobile, eyes closed, remembering death? Get up 7 a.m., spring sunlight out the window, a noise, a New Yorican drunkard on the corner remind me of Naomi, Peter, my nephew, Alan. Am I mad myself? Have I always been so? Waking in New York, 61st year to realize childless, I'm a motherless freak, like so many million worlds from Patterson, Los Angeles to the Amazon, humans and whales screaming in despair from Empire State Building top to Arctic Ocean bottom.
I can say one thing for them, his poems, unblushingly, compared to the atom bomb, they are filled with life-giving qualities. Henry Miller on Corso. Cruelty might be very human and very cultural, but it's not acceptable. That's Jodie Foster uh, receiving her Academy Award. What my Aunt Kate says about it, Aunt Kate has a retarded daughter. She says, you ought to thank the Lord you have brain enough to get depressed. Lately, all I do is mope around my apartment in a yellow terry cloth robe. <laughs> I don't blame you. Let me see, what can I... We love you! Oh, I understand that. I get carried away. The opposite is also true. Your greatest fan is jealous of your talent. Banking on your death collects your work. Friends buy you an apartment to get you off the street. Gypsum dust from the wallboard poisons you. <laughs> A whole operation fell into chaos till U.S. intelligence came into layoffs. I tell you no lie, I'm a true American. Our big pusher there was Fumi Nosovan. All them pushes in a power play, but Fumi was the man for the CIA. <laughs> Oh, thank God, when I'm dead, I won't have to put up with people. <laughs>